the presence of the Lord. Let's pray together as we get back into the word of God in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for who you are. We want to thank you for who you are to us. We want to thank you for the power of your word. We want to thank you for light. We want to thank you that you have not left us in darkness. We want to thank you that it pleased you to prepare us so that you don't meet us unprepared. The rest of the world don't have this information. Oh, Father, the rest of the world, they don't have this information. They don't even know that something is happening, that someone is coming, but it has pleased you to give us light so that we will not walk in darkness. Father, for this, we are grateful to you in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask tonight that your Holy Spirit will walk in us what is good and pleasing in your sight, that we will be a people prepared for your coming. Not just prepared to be saved as by passing through fire, but prepared and ready in such a way that, Lord, we will get a reward when you come. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. So, like I said, thank you very much uh, for coming back as we continue uh, in the word of God this evening. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, in the morning during the church service, we, we are looking at the fact that we are looking at the wider context of our story. And we saw that our theme is arising from the visitation of the angel to the parents of John the Baptist. And that had to do with when the angel Gabriel came to um, Zachariah as he was in the temple doing his work. And you remember that we saw that the fact that Zachariah and Elizabeth were living right and doing right did not remove the problems of life automatically from them. So what that means is that the fact that you are a believer, that you are a child of God, does not mean that you are not going to face trials. You are not going to face difficulties and challenges. And when those kind of things come, as a child of God, keep your eyes on God and continue to do your work. Zachariah could have resigned. Zachariah could have said, all these priests... Um, all of this priest business and all of this priest work where is the result so this is what you get for being priest and you are serving in the temple and then your wife is barren what kind of problem is this you know that's what many believers do when the problems of life come to you you start regretting righteousness there are many believers that regret righteousness. You are regretting that you are doing the right thing. That's not a good thing. Continue to do right. Continue to keep your eyes on the Lord. Madam, is it Bible you are reading on your phone? Ma, are you reading Bible? Make sure it's Bible. Don't allow phone to cheat you. Remember I said, your phone can prove that you are not hungry this period so do not regret righteousness do not come to any point where you say can you imagine I have kept myself all of these years I am not sleeping around you know I, I'm, I'm not going from man to man to man to man and now look at it I am not married what kind of trouble is this you don't know that there are many sisters like that you have waited for husband and while you are waiting you're keeping yourself, you are living right, you are not living in sin, 
but husband is not coming. Rather, it is the one that is running around town. That's the one that is married. And now she even has two children and you are still waiting. The pain is real. The loneliness is real. But the question is, what are you going to do when the trials of life come to you? Are you going to abandon the righteousness that you are committing? Are you going to stop obeying God? Are you going to stop working with God? Oh, okay. imagine that Zachariah resigned. He would not have been there the, the day that the angel showed up. I said, imagine that Zachariah resigned and packed up. He was angry with God. And he said, God, how can you do this kind of thing to me? Then the day they remembered his case and sent the angel from heaven, the man would have resigned before his miracle arrived. You will not resign before your miracle arrives. You will hold the fort. You will stand. No wonder the Bible says, having done all what are you supposed to do he said stand he says stand therefore having your loins gathered about with the belt of truth huh? and then you take the shield of faith and all the other breastplate of righteousness and the weapons of our warfare so I want to encourage you child of God no matter what has happened no matter what is happening keep staying true to God God never forgets people that are faithful to him. Hallelujah. Huh? Shall not God avenge his elect who cry to him day and night? Jesus said, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find people that are standing for God no matter the problem, no matter the crisis, this is part of your preparation to be ready for the coming of Jesus. If you are somebody that if things are not going well, you pack up church, you don't read your Bible, you don't pray, you will not be ready. You will not be ready. You need to become a rugged believer. You have made up your mind that no matter what happens, Huh? You are moving forward in Christ. Satan kai karia baza mukuma bayaba gaba gaba de. Satan, you are telling a lie. We are not going back. We are not going back. I'm moving forward. I have made up my mind. Listen, we are not of those that draw back but of those that press on to the saving of the soul. I have made up my mind, I am not going back. I am not looking back. When the Bible talks about the armor of a Christian, there is nothing for your back. You have the shield of faith, you have the breastplate of righteousness, you have the shoe of the gospel of peace, you have the sword of the spirit, you have the helmet of salvation, there is nothing for your back. Meaning that once you turn back, you have exposed yourself to the enemy. The easiest way for the devil to finish somebody who is a believer is for you to turn back. Set your face. Whether there is money in your pocket or not, you are going to serve God. Whether there is husband or there is no husband. Can you imagine that you have been waiting, there is no husband. Then you go and start sleeping around and then the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes. Is it worth it? Eternity in a lake of fire compared with the temporary pleasure that you were enjoying. Is it worth it? What shall he profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? You get hus I don't know why I'm talking particularly about the matter of husband. Maybe there is somebody like that. You get husband, you get money, you get all the houses and then you lose your soul. We didn't come to Jesus so that we can find husband. We came to Jesus so that we can find eternal salvation. We didn't come to Jesus so that first of all we can get money or solve our problems or get a baby. Those things are good. But the Bible said, seek ye first. Somebody say first. 
I can't hear some of you. First, first, first. One more time. First. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then what is going to happen now? Everything else will be added. So let's learn that from Zechariah and from Elizabeth. They refuse to change. They refuse to compromise righteousness simply because they had a problem. Hallelujah. Remember too that we then established the fact that John the Baptist was going to be great in the sight of God. But it will not be great and greatness according to human measurement of greatness. If you are going to be ready for the return of Jesus, you cannot use the standard, the mudu. You cannot use the measuring standards of this world to measure anything. If you do that, this world will deceive you. This world will cheat you. This world will distract you. The reason is because the standards of this world are not an accurate measurement of greatness. They are not an accurate measurement of priorities. So he said, John the Baptist will be great. Where will he be great? In the sight of the Lord. I want to be great in the sight of the Lord. I want to be great where it matters. To tell you the truth, I don't want popularity. I want to please God. I'm not trying to be popular. I, don't, I, I, I want to have influence for God. I don't want my face on a big billboard. The international great man of God. No, I'm not interested. I want Jesus to say to me, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of of your master. That's what I am looking for. That's what I want. So, we must use the divine standards of measurement if we are going to measure correctly. And then don't forget, they said concerning John the Baptist, he is going to go in the power and spirit of Elijah to turn hearts to God, to make ready for the Lord people that are prepared at his coming so remember this is Luke chapter 1 verse 17 can we go to Luke chapter 1 and then read it from verse 17 let's read that text again and then we are going to make some more progress so John the Baptist will also go before him before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn, remember that word turn, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Hallelujah. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Blessed be the name of Jesus. So what I want us to do further this evening is to now go further in the word of God to examine the marks of the ready. How can I know that I am ready? Are there certain marks, certain things that will be present in my life that will help me to know that I am ready? And the first thing I want to do is to list several of them. Then wherever we stop this evening, hopefully tomorrow and the next day, then we can focus on those things. But the first mark of those that are ready, number one, is that they share the same nature with the Lord. They share the same nature. Commonality of nature with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, just note that the same nature with Christ. 
Number two is that they have a correct relationship with the Lord. They have a correct and current relationship. Huh? Notice the two words I use. Their relationship with the Lord is correct and that relationship is current. Their relationship with Jesus is not historical. They have a correct and current relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Number three. The alarms are on fire. The alarms are on fire. They are burning for their master. Not just that they have a relationship with Jesus, that relationship is on fire. The alarms are burning. That's number three. Number four is they are occupying for the Lord. They are occupying for the Lord. So number one, they have the same nature as the Lord. Number two, they have a correct and current relationship with the Lord. Number three, their lamps are on fire. They are burning. And then number four, they are occupying for their master. They are occupying for their master. And then number five, they are expecting. They are expecting, watching and expecting the return of their master. They are watching for it and they are expecting it. And then, um, uh, I believe this is number six now, they are empowered. They are empowered. They are not doing these things just in their own strength. There is supernatural ability that is helping them to prepare for his coming. There is supernatural power that is enabling them to live in a way that they will be ready and they will be burning and they will be occupying for their master. So, I'll mention the six of them quickly again. Number one, they have the same nature as the Lord. Number two, they have a correct and current relationship with Jesus. Number three, their lamps are on fire. They are burning for their master. Number four, they are occupying. They are occupying for their Lord, for their master. Number five, they are watching for and expecting the return of their master. They are actually expecting and they are watching for it. And then finally, number six, they are empowered. There is a supernatural divine enablement that clothes them and strengthens them and walks in them and walks through them as they are doing all of these things that we have seen. So let's begin with number one. They share the same nature as their master. So let's begin now. Let's go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. I would like to read it from verse 1. 1 John chapter 3 from verse 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because he did not know him. Please, note what this scripture is saying. He said, what manner of love the Father has poured out, has bestowed, showered upon us that we, 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 who we are formerly not a people, we, who we are lost and hopeless, we, we should be called children of God. So, note he's talking about children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because he did not know him. The world 
should not understand a Christian. I said the world should not understand a Christian. The people in your office should not understand your decisions. There are some of the things you do, they should call you stupid. The actions you take should not make sense to those who don't believe what you believe. And I'm not talking about somebody who is crazy or mad. I'm talking of somebody who is different. Somebody who has different priorities. Somebody who, what is important to you is not what is important to them. And what is important to them is not what is important to you. For example, imagine that there is a contract. There is a contract of, sir, there is one of uh, your friends, top person in full gospel. He told me a story. Back in the days of uh, PTF, when they were giving those, uh, you know, those petroleum trust fund contracts. So his company applied and he got the contract. They were going to award him the contract. He was the best person. This contract ran into hundreds of millions of naira. Imagine almost 30 years ago, back in those days of PTF. Hundreds of millions. And the people came to him and said, well, you are the person that is qualified for this contract and we have decided to give it to you, but you will have to add our own money to it. He said, I'm very sorry, I don't do such things. They said, are you mad? Is there something wrong with you? It's not your money. The money will not be taken from your own money. The, the, the money is our money. It's the government money. You just add our own to the one that you have bidded. Then we give you the contract. As soon as you are paid, you give us our own and you will still keep, keep your complete money. He said, I am sorry. I cannot be used to take away the money that belongs to the government. They say, you are not serious. Get out of this. Get out of here. And they gave the contract to somebody else. You see, the world does not understand him. You see, as a child of God, you should be making decisions that make you look as if you are crazy. Why is that so? Because you are traveling in a different direction. You belong to another kingdom. I'll give you a personal example. I trained as a medical doctor and I was in medical practice for, since, from 1988 to 2003. That's 15 years. I, I left medical school in 1988. That's when I became a doctor. And I practiced for 15 years. And then a point came when I knew <laughs> that person is looking at me, is calculating my age. <laughs> Every time I say that, I can see them. I say, I, I know somebody. Somebody is doing the mathematics and trying to compute. <laughs> eh? So, after 15 years in medical practice, I knew from prayer and from seeking God that it was time to leave active medical practice. Because I travel a lot. If I was a pastor in a particular town, I would continue to practice medicine. But the nature of my own assignment takes me a lot of travel. And I became an absentee doctor. And I was in private practice. So a point came when I knew that it was time to leave medical practice to preach the gospel. Question, does that make sense to the world that a trained medical doctor, very intelligent, brilliant, one of the, you know, best doctors in the class that is going to abandon medical practice to go and say that he's preaching. The world does not know us. Make sure that this world doesn't know you. Make sure that you are not traveling in the same road when the world says amen, you say amen. When they say celebrity, you say celebrity. You know that thing they call celebrity? Eh? Have you heard the word celebrity before? Where are these people being celebrated? Who is celebrating? They are being celebrated here. Who is celebrating them? It's the world that is celebrating them. Many of those so-called celebrities, these are the people that are corrupting the world with their music, with their films, and with all of their nudity and their nakedness. But they are the ones that people follow. 
So those celebrities, they, they come on Twitter or on Facebook or somewhere. They say, follow me. But don't forget that Jesus also said, follow me. So who are you following? The world should not know you. Your decisions should not conform with the ways of the world. Why is that so? Because you belong to another kingdom. The Father has showered this love upon us and we are different people. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody give God praise in this place. Hallelujah. Do you know the love of the Father? So, look what he now says in verses 2 and 3. He said, Beloved, now are we the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Note, same nature. Because we are his children, when he is revealed, we shall be like him. How can we be sure of that? Because we have his nature. We have his nature. Now, why are we going to be like him? Because we shall see him as he is. Now, please look at number three, verse three there. And everyone who has this hope in him, which hope? The hope of seeing him as he is. The hope of being ready when he appears. Everyone who has this hope in him, what does the person do? He purifies himself as he is pure. In other words, you remove from your nature everything that is not in his nature. You strive for unity and harmony of nature. Why is that so? Because the one that you are expecting is holy. If you are unholy, there is going to be a problem because you, you cannot be ready like that. Is this making sense now? That's why you must be born again. You must become a new creature. Let me give you a simple example. A goat can never be ready to meet a lion. Do you know that if you bath a goat, you shave the hair, you do everything to a goat, and then you prepare it to meet a lion? Can the goat ever be ready to meet a lion? Why can he not be ready to meet a lion? Because they are, two of them are very different. He is actually coming to meet something that we eat it. Does that make sense? But what if the goat we are to get born again? The goat, if it was possible for the goat to get another nature, and now the goat is born as a lion cub. Do you know that even a baby cub, a lion cub, huh, that's a newborn lion, is ready to meet the big lion. Why is that so? Because they share the same nature. Except if you meet a jealous uh, uh, male that will kill the cubs of the female so that he can, he can marry her. Those kind of things happen. But generally, if that cub is born of that massive lion, the cub is not, in fact, the cub is running forward in his direction to meet him. And you look at this lion going like that, more than maybe like 220 kilograms, 220 kilograms, lion, 500 pounds, massive, walking like that. And it's coming, the little cub, will be chuckling. <laughs> and then he will come before him. He's not afraid. Why is he not afraid? Because he has the same nature. They share the same character. They are of the same family. What? Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. When you are born again, when you are saved, you receive a new nature. And by virtue of this new nature, you are not afraid. If, as you are sitting in this place, you are frightened by the coming of Jesus, that's a bad sign. 
Do you know that some, some Christians, when they hear that Jesus is coming, their minds will go, Fia! Jesus is coming, oh. Jesus is coming, oh. Why are they terrified? Because there is something in their life, there is something in their nature that is contrary to the one that is coming. So how do you solve that problem? You're going to come to God this evening and ask him to change your nature. You are going to come to him this evening and ask him to purify, to purify, to take away anything that is contrary to the divine nature so that you can be ready for his return. So that's the first mark of those that are ready. Number two mark is a correct and current relationship with the Lord. Correct and current. There's a reason I'm saying those two. First of all, let's deal with the first component, the correct component. That was actually the heart of the message of John the Baptist. That was the, the core of his message. So, let's go back to Luke chapter 3 and read a bit of what John preached. The gospel of Luke and now we are in chapter 3. So, from verse 3, John went into all the region around Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Verse 4, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So watch the preparation as Isaiah prophesied it. What is the first part of that preparation? Eh? Make his paths straight. So, you are dealing with a road, a path, and that path, I mean, all of us that know, all of us know paths because you know the stream in your village. Do you have a stream in your village where you used to go to fetch water? Eh? We have something like that in my place. And there is a path that leads to the stream. And it is winding. It's not a wide road. It's not a big road. It's a path. Now, if you were to make that path straight, you have quite some work to do. Because the path is winding, is doing corner corner like that, is bending, and you are supposed to make it straight. You see, when something is straight, it means that it is on a line. Eh? It's on a line. So there is a line that is straight. And then the path is now straight. For you to understand what I'm trying to explain to you, do you remember when Saul of Tarsus met Jesus on the road? You remember that story in Acts chapter 9? Do you remember that? Remember that Jesus then spoke to a man called Ananias. And he said, Ananias, he said, Lord, go, to the, go into the city of Damascus and go to which street? Who remembers the kind of street, sir? Straight. So, in, go to straight street in Damascus. Do you know Damascus is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world? Damascus. People have lived in Damascus for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. Long, long, long before David conquered Jerusalem. And made it his capital. And even Jerusalem, you know that people were deported from Jerusalem. So people have, there was a point when only the very poor people were left in the place and the city was scattered. But Damascus, 
people have lived in Damascus from the Old Testament. You have had those Syrian kings and Damascus has been there. And I saw a picture of, of ancient Damascus and that street, straight, is actually straight. It's a straight street like this that runs through the heart of the town of Damascus, the city of Damascus. Now here is the point. Saul of Tarsus met Jesus along the road. And of all the streets where Saul was to be found in Damascus, what was the only street that Jesus told Ananias to go and look for a man that he had encountered? What was the name of the street? Straight. Not corner, corner street. Not bend, bend street. Not crooked street. Not up and down street. What's the name of this street, everybody? Straight. In other words, after somebody encounters Jesus, the only correct place to locate the person is on a street called straight. A life that is straight. Character that is straight. A life that is not crooked. It's not twisted. It's not bent. It's not out of line. It is straight. Straight with his wife. Straight with his children. Straight with his business. Straight in his character. Straight in the public. Straight in the secret place. So what did John the Baptist say? He said, make his paths straight. Then he continued to explain to us what to do as part of our preparation. So what did he say we should do? He said, every valley will be filled. What's a valley? A valley is a deficit. A valley is a depression. It's a place that is not level. But don't forget the king is coming. And the glory is about to be revealed. So for that to happen, the king of glory is going to travel. You, he doesn't want to go and then he will descend into a valley and then come up again. They said, fill up the valleys. That means, attend to the deficits in your life. Attend to what is lacking. Where are the areas of failure? Where are the aspects of your character that are not in line with the word of God? Don't excuse it. Don't say, well, you know, anger is in my family. Anger runs in my family. In fact, eh, hmm, when we get angry in my family like this, eh, hi. When we get angry, ah, just come out for road, clear from the road. You are making an excuse for a valley. I said you are making an excuse for what? For a valley. What are you supposed to do with the valley now? Fill it up. And the good news is that the, there is no valley that the grace of God cannot fill. I said there is no valley that the grace of God cannot fill. There is no deficit. There is no flaw. There is nothing that is missing in somebody's life that Christ cannot fill. But that cannot happen while we are making excuses. Maybe there is a valley. Your life is okay financially. Your life is okay physically. You are healthy. But your marriage is a valley. Oh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The psalmist said that we fear no evil. So there is a valley in your marriage. Is that marriage is the low point. Is the thing that is eating you from inside. Fill up the valleys. Fill up the valley. Make his path straight. Fill up the valley. And then what else are we supposed to do next there? Every mountain and high hill will be what? Everybody now will be brought low. Those are the superfluities, the grammar. Those are the excesses. Those are the bombs. Those are the little hills along our road. Things like pride. You know, the haughtiness, the arrogance, the life that is puffed up, 
Nobody can talk to you. Do you know that that pride is about to scatter something in your life? They say, level the mountains. Level the mountains. Come down from your high horse. Huh? All of this is part of our preparation. Then what else did they say? He said, the crooked places will be made straight. You see straight again. That means there are some places that are crooked. They will be made straight. And the rough places will be made smooth. So you see, this thing is progressive. Huh? Make his path straight. How are we going to do it? Just watch those that do road construction. How do they end up with a road that is straight? They fill up the valley. They level the mountain. They straighten the crooked places. And then they smoothen the rough places. The rough edges. Oh God, smoothen the rough edges of my life. Oh Father, fill up the valleys in my life. Father, bring down the high hills and the mountains. That there may be a road for your glory to be revealed. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. And look at verse 6. When all of these things have been done, now what will be the result, everybody? And all flesh will see the salvation of God. Or as it says in Isaiah's account, it says, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Are you interested in the glory? I said, are you interested in the glory? Christ in you, the hope of glory. For the full revelation of that glory, this preparation is very important. So when you now look at verse 7, if you now look at verse 7, John now said to the multitudes that came to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, Children of snakes, who want you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bring forth fruits or bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Don't make any excuse. Let your life show that you have repented. Let your life prove that you are a new person. Eh? Don't make any claim. Don't say I'm born again. Don't say I sing in the choir. Don't even say I speak in tongues. Because John is not talking about speaking in tongues. He's talking about a life that is correct in the sight of God. He's not talking about being a good musician. He's talking about a character that pleases God. They say we have Abraham as our father. We are members of the old original church. My grandfather was one of the founding fathers of so so and so church. All of those things are wonderful. But John the Baptist is telling us and scripture is telling us that those things will not be enough. Hallelujah. It says even now the acts is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit, what did John say about it now? That tree is cut down and thrown into the fire. In the Bible, tree refers very often to people. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, they are going to be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. And now John the Baptist is talking about trees. And he said every tree that does not produce good fruit. What will happen to this tree? It is cut down. But he's not talking about a tree planted outside. He's talking about human beings. Remember Jesus spoke about the barren tree. And the master said... How often am I going to come to this tree? For the past three years, I'm looking for fruit and I didn't get any fruit. Cut it down. He was talking about a human being. He was talking about people, not a physical tree. 
So as far as God is concerned, you are a tree. And God expects fruit from you. Hallelujah. He says every tree that does not bear good fruit, good fruit, what does God do? He said he cuts it down. John asked them a question. He said, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is coming? Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, wrath is coming to this world. Judgment is not far away. I know that this is not popular. But the truth is that judgment is... See, judgment has to come. Don't you think that in a place, in a world, where people will come and slaughter other human beings and walk away free, don't you think that there should be judgment? But there will be problem if you yourself are on that same side on the day of judgment. Maybe it's not killing somebody that puts you on that wrong side. Maybe it is another sin. But the important thing is that now you're on the same side. How can you imagine going to church and being on the same side as people that killed other human beings? That's why you don't make an excuse for a valley. You don't make an excuse for a, a mountain, a, a, something that is high. You level the mountain, fill up the valley. Listen, don't pamper yourself when you are preparing for his coming. Write that down. Don't pamper yourself. Don't tell yourself, say, well, you know, it's not a problem. It doesn't matter. He will understand. That's a very dangerous thing to do. The day that the master showed up in Isaiah chapter 6, who knows what was Isaiah's problem that day? Who remembers what was Isaiah's problem on the day that the master showed up in Isaiah chapter 6? He was a man of unclean lips. So it was his mouth that was the problem. It was Isaiah's mouth. The man was a prophet. The man was not an adulterer. He was not a thief. He was not an armed robber. This man never killed anybody. He doesn't do any of these evil things. But what was the problem? What was the problem with Isaiah? It was his mouth. But when the Holy One of Israel arrived, that mouth became a matter. You know, this thing I'm sharing with you is, is, is alarming. I saw the Lord Jesus Christ in, in uh, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. He was commending the church in Ephesus chapter 2. He said, I know your works. You are like this. You are like that. You are like that. You have done this. You have tested people that claim to be apostles. And they are not apostles. They are telling lies. You have held fast. You are working hard. You say, but I have something against you. What is it that you have against us? You say, you have left your first love. You don't love me the way you loved me before. Ah, uh ah. -uh. But we are still doing plenty good things. But even that matter was serious enough for the Lord to say, if you don't repent, I will take away your candlestick. I will remove your lamp. And do you know that that thing happened to the church in Ephesus? Ephesus is used to be in modern day Turkey. Today, Turkey is something like 98% Muslim. But many of those churches, you know, Smyrna, Ephesus, Pegamos, they were all in Turkey. So what happened that those churches disappeared? It was the little matter. It was the little matter. So don't make any excuse. And when that mouth starts misbehaving, don't blame it on somebody. Don't say, eh, the reason I got angry is because, you know, you did that. The reason you got angry is because there is anger inside you. The reason you did that is because once we are making any excuse, we will not be ready. Brothers and sisters, there is judgment that is coming. John the Baptist said, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is coming? 
Hallelujah. Now, look at some very practical steps that John provided. So, in verse 10, the people ask him, saying, So, what shall we do then? And John did not over spiritualize, he practicalized. He said, If you have two coats, give to the person who does not have. If you have food, share with the person who does not have. Then the tax collectors came to him to be baptized. And they said, Teacher, what shall we do? He said, Stop collecting more than you are told to collect. You know, those tax collectors we collect both for Caesar and collect for themselves. But people don't know the amounts now, they don't know which one is which. So, whichever one the tax collector told you, you have to pay. They were collecting much, much more than was appointed. So John said, stop doing that. Let there be change that reflects even in your work. Stop taking away property from your office and carrying it to your house. Stop cheating your employer. You go to work by 11.30. You leave by 2 o'clock and you are collecting salary, full salary. He says, stop. He said, my friend, and this government work. Please listen to me. There is nothing like government work. All work is God's work for a child of God. What did the Bible say in the book of Colossians? He said, whatever you do in word or deed, do it as unto the government. Is that what the Bible says? No. He said, do it as unto the Lord. Because you are going to receive a reward from the Lord Jesus Christ. The soldiers also came and they asked him, saying, what shall we do? He said, don't intimidate anybody or accuse anybody falsely. Be satisfied with your salary. Do you notice that John the Baptist did not spiritualize his preparation? Please listen, brothers and sisters. Today's church, we must go back to practical Christianity. Christianity that manifests in character, it manifests in speech, it manifests at work, it manifests in my house, it manifests in my relationships. Don't collect more than you have been appointed. Don't inflate the contract. Remember, we are looking at number two. Those that will be ready for the return of Jesus, they will have a correct relationship with the master. You, you are, there is no quarrel. You are not breaking scripture. Your life is not contrary to the character of God. So first of all, you have the same nature. Then secondly, that nature is manifesting in practical life. Ha. One day I asked some people a question And the question was this Can you account for the money in your account? Imagine that Jesus called you And asked you to account for all the money in your account can you account for it? Or there will be one, two million, six hundred and twenty-three thousand, fifty-five kobo that came in. And Jesus said, where did this money come from? He said, um, 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 Lord, you know, there was this deal. And you know, we are sharing the money. And this is what I got from You say is what you got from where You say but my friend and everybody is doing it Listen sir If you are planning to see Jesus The Bible says anybody who has This hope in him What does the person do He purifies himself just as the person you are going to meet Is pure Not according to Nigerian government Can you account for the money in your account or maybe you are a lady. Jesus said, this 220 something, this 220,000, I can see it two times in your account. 
It shows there in June, and now um, it shows there in April, and now around June, it's also showing there. Where did the money come from? You say, um, 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 <laughs> Lord, um, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, it was that man that sent me a lot. Which man? Who sent the alert? What, then Jesus will say, what is your relationship with the man that sent you this money? What did you do that made him to send this money to you? If we are going to be ready for the return of Jesus, we cannot make any assumption. The, our Christianity must become practical. It must, our Christianity must follow us to the office. He must follow us into where we are discussing contract. Tax collectors. Now, oh, glory to God. And I found, do you know, sir, eh? as I was looking at the message of John the Baptist, I saw why Nigeria is the way Nigeria is. There is a lack of customized truth. Hey, hey, hallelujah. Please listen. In the Bible, I found that there is general truth. General truth that is spoken to everybody. But apart from general truth in scripture, there is also customized truth that is directed to specific people, specific professions, specific situations. I'll give you an example. The Bible says, repent. John the Baptist says, repent. But what does repent mean for a tax collector? Did, did you get the point now? For a tax collector, repent means stop collecting more than what has been appointed to you. You say repent. What does repent mean for a soldier? For us that preach the gospel, we should be asking ourselves, what does repent mean for a politician? What does repent mean for a governor? Repent means stop keeping back the salaries of civil servants that you are holding. Stop putting the money in your secret account so that you can get interest when people are not paid. Stop flying abroad when you have not paid people their salaries. That is the kind of preaching that changes society. If we just preach a general sermon, excuse me please, what does repent mean for a nurse that is working in the hospital? Repent means stop harassing patients that you are supposed to take care of. Oh, you have not seen nurses harassing patients. Some of you women, when you were in labor, do you want to hear about those nurses that attended to you? They start insulting you, then they will slap you. Bah! Come on, madam, push. Push. We will leave you here and go away. Oh. Where we are we there when you are collecting this pregnancy? Push. This is what a Christian nurse is doing to a person who is in a place of need. A woman in labor, desperate. Instead of encouraging the person and ministering the love of Jesus to the person, you are being wicked where a baby is being born. Let me tell you a story. Listen to a story. My wife died. Listen to story. You know how my wife died? My wife died at the birth of our third child. The pregnancy went very well. And then towards the end of the pregnancy, eight months plus, we realized that her blood pressure was going up. I took her to the hospital. Meanwhile, she was going to Antinata. There was nothing wrong. I took her to Antinata. Well, she used to go to Antinata. Everything was going on well. 
So when we, she, then she started having headaches and some other problem, I took her to see the doctor. The blood pressure was going up. The doctor wrote some medicine and which she took. On Sunday, she was strong enough. She went to church. That Sunday, I was not feeling well myself. So I didn't go to church. She drove the children to church. Our two children came back. That, mon- that Sunday night, she was not feeling well. So Monday, I took her to hospital. They wrote some medicine for her. By Tuesday, late in the night, her situation became very serious. I rushed that to the hospital. Listen to story. So you will see. Look, this Christianity that we are doing that does not practically manifest in your everyday life is a lie. This Christianity that is driving against the traffic because there is hold up. Then you, Christian, you turned your car against the traffic and you are driving like this. You should thank God that you are not in Lagos because they will crush your car. They will take it and auction it. You see, Christians that are coming from church, they are driving against the traffic. This Christianity that does not stop when the red light says stop, you are not preparing to meet Jesus. He said, but Ferdinand, does he reach that? The answer to that is yes. This Christianity that is in the university with a stolen certificate, there is something wrong with it, though. John the Baptist was not, this preparation was detailed because the person that is coming is detailed. Back to the story I was telling you. So, I took her that Tuesday night. The doctor was talking to her. She became unconscious. This is now very early, maybe like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., Tuesday morning. So, as she became unconscious, we rushed, they rushed her to the ward, admitted her, cut the long story short. They did operation to bring out the baby. And the operation was successful. The baby was alive, and my wife came out of the theater alive. I was praising God. Now the worst is over. Thank God. She will just begin to recover. Brothers and sisters, I went to go and donate blood and get some other things done. By the time I came, she came out of the theater around 10, 11. By the time I came back around 2, 2.30, the nurses in the hospital, in the ward, had not given her the medicine that the doctor wrote from the theater. They sat in the nurses' bay. You know that place where nurses normally stay? They sat there, they were telling stories. Now, doctor, you will know, sir, if a woman is in labor by herself, the womb will contract so she will not bleed. This is the normal thing. But if you cut a pregnant womb, you have to give medicine that will help the womb to contract. Am I, am I correct, sir? All those medicines that they wrote for my wife from the, from the theater, the nurses are not giving her. This. And the medicines were there. They sat there telling stories. By the time I came back, I said, you have not given her the medicine that doctor wrote for her. You know what they told me? He said, are you the one to teach us our job? You know the trouble between doctors and nurses. You know that rivalry. Doctors are very arrogant. Many nurses are very insecure. So when arrogance, when pride collides with insecurity, you have chaos. The two elephants are fighting. The patient is the one that is suffering. I am not talking about every nurse. There are good nurses. I'm not talking about every doctor. There are good doctors. So please, spare Brother Ferdinand. Don't say Brother Ferdinand said all the nurses are bad. I didn't say that. There are wonderful nurses who are, may God bless them and continue to use them. There are terrible doctors. I have plenty of stories. Doctors that will not treat a patient. You are working in a government hospital. But before you will treat the patient, you collect money for your own private pocket. Apart from your salary. If you don't give them the money, they will not write your name in the operation list. So you know the kind of thing I'm talking about. My younger brother had something that needed surgery, orthopedic surgery. I went to talk to a doctor who is in a topedic hospital. And I said, doctor, my brother, he said, okay, well, uh, you know, apart from paying the hospital bill, 
uh, well, for you as a colleague, you have to pay my own fees. Uh-uh. Pay your own fees. You are a consultant in the hospital. The, you, are, you are collecting salary. Now I'm going to bring my brother to the government hospital. You will do the operation with government equipment, government cat god sutures, government everything. But I have to pay you privately. How much money was he quoting? Large amount of money. After paying the hospital bill, I have to pay him. If you don't do it, they will not put your name in the operation list. You will wait forever. Many of them are Christians. They are not preparing to meet Jesus. They are not preparing to meet Christ. Let me finish my story and find a place to close the teaching. So, they, not, they told me, are you the one to teach us our work? Brothers and sisters, by this time, my wife's abdomen was swelling. She was bleeding inside. If you checked her eye, she was paper white. She was, she was losing blood inside. They got up from their place there, you know, walked to the, down to the ward, um, injected, put it in. A few minutes later, my wife died. And many of them, we are Christian nurses. Christian, at least they go to church. They are not from the other religion. If this, your Christian chi does not affect the way you live and the kind of work you do and the way you treat people, maybe there is somebody you borrowed money from and you are expecting Jesus. Go and pay the person. He said, my friend, I don't have money. Call the person today and set up a payment plan. Somebody that you cheated in business, go and meet the person. Go and make it right. If you are trying to take away somebody's husband, stop! In the name of Jesus, stop! You are hanging around a married man. What are you doing with a married man? You cannot see that the man has wife. And you are doing message. You are sending him message. He's replying you. Two of you are chatting. He said, hey baby, you're looking very cute. He said, thank you, sir. And then he will send emoji. You know that emoji that is smiling and dancing? Then he will send his own. Two of you are sending, you are, there's something wrong with your head. You are not planning to meet Jesus. Those that will be ready to meet Christ, they will be people that have a correct relationship with Jesus. They are living right. Look at all the things that John the Baptist, oh God, can you imagine if we preach this kind of message in Nigeria? What does repent mean for a policeman? We should tell them so that they will check. Imagine a governor is sitting down inside church he has not paid people's salaries for the past four, five, six months and he's traveling abroad. He's paying himself. What does repent mean for him? And then the second component of that relationship is that it is current. This relationship is correct and it is current. Current means that it is not a historical relationship. It's not well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in those days when we used to pray for three hours every day. <laughs> in those days. You know, <laughs> in fact, eh, I remember eh, Kai, when I used to win souls, every week I would even win one soul. You see, what you are doing, you are talking about history. The question is, what is the present situation? Hallelujah. The reason is because how Jesus meets you is the true indication of your state. It's how he meets you. If he meets you doing what he called you to do and doing what you are supposed to do, then you are okay. But if it was history, he said, well, God knows I used to respect my husband. 
I used to love my wife. No, no. That is historical. And it is not sufficient. Blessed be the name of Jesus Christ. Come on church. Blessed be the name of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Hallelujah. And then the final one, and then we are going to pray. Come with me to Luke chapter 12. The final one for tonight. They will be believers that have lamps that are on fire. Luke Luke chapter 12 from verse 35 this is the Lord Jesus speaking he said let your waist be girded and then your lambs be doing what let your lambs be doing what be burning and you yourselves be like unto men who are doing what? Who are waiting for their master when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks they may open to him immediately. So you see, they open immediately because they are ready. Hallelujah. They will open to him. How will they open to him everybody now? Immediately. Because they are ready. Look at verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will get himself and have them sit down to eat and then he will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. Verse 39. But know this. That if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, what will have happened? He will have watched and will not have allowed his house to be broken into. So, verse 40 now. Therefore, you also be what? Be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So, we can see clearly here that Jesus is talking about being ready for his return. But go back to that verse 35. How did he say we are to be ready? He said, let your waist be what? Gathered. Let there be a belt. Huh? Your belt is very powerful. Your belt helps to hold your clothes in place. He said, let your belt be strong. The Bible talks about the belt of truth. Eh? The belt of truth. So you are living a life that is true and you are growing in the truth of the word of God. But then, apart from the belt, he is now saying, let your lambs be burning. Let your lambs be on fire. Let your lambs be on fire. A mark of those who are ready. Hey, hallelujah. A mark of those who are ready for the return of Jesus is that there is a fire that is burning in their hearts. There is a fire that is burning inside them for the glory of their master. They are not lukewarm church members that everybody is begging them, pushing them like wheelbarrow to go to program, pushing them to pray, pushing them to read their Bible, pushing them to give an offering in the church. And then somebody will beg and say, well, you know, brethren, we need uh, 220,000. You have seen our building now. You, we have work to do. All of you that will be able to give 5,000, please come now. And then two people will come out. He said, is it only two people? 5,000? Ah, uh, <laughs> Try and come. Then one more person will come out. Ah, is it, is it only the three of you? It's okay. Let's pray. Those that will give 2,000, come out. Meanwhile, the people that are giving 5,000 in the church are building their own project in their house. And they are spending millions. But when it comes to the things of God, they behave as if they don't know the meaning of the word money. No. Those that will be ready, they will be people that are passionate. Oh, they are burning with a fire. 
the Bible said concerning John the Baptist, I like that verse. John chapter 5 and verse 35. Help me. John chapter 5 and verse 35. You know what he says in John 5 35? Everybody, let's read it and then we'll be close. John chapter 5 verse 35. Everybody help me. Let's read it. One, two, go. He was what? A burning and a... What kind of light was this John the Baptist that was preparing people for the return of Jesus? He was a man that was on fire. He was a... This is Jesus talking. Jesus said John the Baptist was a burning and a shining light. The man was burning and because he was burning, he was shining. Do you know that in nature, there is no light without fire. There is no light without fire. Jesus said nobody lights a lamp. Do you know Achibarabara? You know Achibarabara? You know, <laughs> you know the native lamp? Atupa in Yoruba? Eh? Mpanaka? Any Igbo person? <laughs> you know Mpanaka? That lamp, the oil lamp. Jesus said nobody lights that lamp and puts it under. But where do you put it? On a stand. So that what will happen? It will give light. But do you know that to light the lamp, what do you do to it? You set it on fire. You strike the match. You hold it. Then the lamp starts burning. You, you, you understand what I'm talking about? The wick starts burning. Then when it catches fire, what do you do with your matches? You blow it off. And then as the thing is burning, what does it do? It's shining. So the shining is a consequence of the burning. It is shining because it is burning. If our lamps are going to shine, there must be a fire. I said there must be a fire. Burning. Jeremiah said, I wanted to resign from preaching. Jeremiah said, God, you have deceived me. You said I should come and preach. But since I entered into the ministry, the only thing that I have to show is pain, persecution, pit, dungeon. They, they hate me. They reject me. That is the salary I get for preaching for you. I'm not preaching anymore. God, I'm going to resign. God, I'm going to resign. But you know what Jeremiah said? He said, his word was like fire. Shut up in my bones. Fire in the bone. Fire in the bone. Jeremiah said, I could not keep quiet. I could not keep quiet. Is there a passion in your heart for the almighty God? Is there a fire burning inside you? Or you are cold in your heart? Jesus warned the church in Laodicea. He said, because you are neither hot nor cold, but you are lukewarm. What did Jesus say he was going to do? He said, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Lukewarm Christianity is the biggest challenge that the church is facing today. If we will catch fire, the other people are not a problem. If Peter and James and John and brother Paul, if they were alive today, will they be afraid of the other side? Because there is a fire burning inside them. There is a fire for the glory of God. Oh, many of us, we are passionate about other things, but not for Christ and his kingdom. When we say praise the Lord, they say hallelujah. But have you seen where they are watching football? Football, English Premiership. Eh? Champions League. When your favorite club, eh? Is it Real Madrid? You <laughs> or Chelsea? <laughs> You're wearing blue. <laughs> Don't mind me. When your favorite club, when they score, what do you, it's a goal! It's a goal! It's a goal! But when we say praise the Lord in church, we say hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> you are not ready for the return of Jesus. You are not ready. <laughs> you are not ready. Your football is a bigger priority to you. It, it boils in your blood. You really like it. But the church and the presence of God, you go cold. 
there are some people you, when you are in church you never know that they can talk when you say let us pray But once church dismisses, hey, I already, when the look at Jesus, I hear boom. When are we going to do this something? In fact, it's long I have never seen you. How come you are dumb in the presence of God, but you are loud somewhere else? Is there something burning inside your bone? Or oh, Jesus is not that important to you? Those that will be ready for the coming of Jesus, number one, they will have the same nature. A goat can never be ready to meet a lion. It's impossible. But if the goat is born again and it becomes a cub, born of the lion of the tribe of Judah, then you will be ready to meet him. Number two, those that will be ready to meet Jesus they will have a correct relationship with Jesus. And that relationship will not be general. It will not be spiritual, in quote. It will be practical. It will be manifest. It will show in their behavior, in their relationships, in their kindness, in their heart of compassion. It will show in their giving. It will show in their obedience. It will show in their work. It will show in their families. Sir, if you are going to be ready for Jesus, it will show the way you treat your wife. Excuse me, please. A man that will raise his hand to slap his wife, is he ready to meet Jesus Christ? Can you imagine that as you are raising your hand to slap your wife, as the slap is landing, Jesus landed. <laughs> Just imagine that as the slap is landing. Jesus landed. <laughs> then you are going to hear, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Excuse me, please. What you are doing now, would you like Jesus to meet you doing it? If the answer to that is no, this is the time to change. The next thing is that that relationship is not just correct, it is also current. It's not historical. The Bible says, he that has an ear, hallelujah, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Not just what the Spirit said, but what the Spirit is saying. You are current with God. And number three point that we have covered tonight, those that will be ready for the return of Jesus, there will be lamps that are on fire, burning burning in the secret, burning in prayer, burning in worship, burning with a passion for Jesus, loving the Lord their God with all their heart, all their mind, and all their soul. Blessed be the name of Jesus Christ. Do you receive this message here today? Let us pray. Let us pray. Would you like to stand up and just begin to pray. Stand up and begin to pray. And pray with all of your heart. Lord, I want to be ready. Do you share the same nature? Let's pray. We are praying. We are praying. Don't, don't keep quiet. I want you to pray. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved call upon his name ask for grace ask him to forgive you ask him to cleanse you ask him to change your heart oh hallelujah oh hallelujah Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus. Ask him to change your nature, change your heart. Say, Jesus, take away the old nature. 
make me a new person somebody pray like that pray 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 ask him to uproot those things in your life all that are not correct if your relationship is historical ask for mercy ask him to bring restoration Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Blessed be the name of Jesus. 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 Let's pray. Let's pray. I want you to make some decisions here tonight. Everybody that John spoke to, they have to be they had to make a decision whether to do what they were hearing or not. Oh, thank you, Father. Plead the grace of God and the blood of Jesus over your heart, over your life, over your family. Precious Father, thank you. Oh, thank you, Heavenly Father, thank you. Now somebody begin to pray for fire. Begin to pray for fire. He said, put your fire in my bones. Father, let my lamp set my lamp on fire.
in that fire. I want you to come forward. I want to pray for you. You are saying, Father, put that fire fresh in my life. Just step forward. Your heart has gone cold towards Jesus. Towards your Bible. I want you to come. And as you come, begin to pray. Begin to pray. Just begin to pray. Or something is saying, you want your life to be correct. Begin to come. Come, come. Let's pray. Just begin to pray. Lift up your voice and call upon the Lord. I say, Father, set my heart on fire. Take away this coldness. Remove this lukewarmness. Oh, God. Oh, God. I want you to pray. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. And say, God, don't pass me by. Father, let my life be correct with you. Let my let your fire, let your fire burn in my heart. Fire for souls, fire for the kingdom, fire for your gospel, fire for your church. Oh, God will not pass you by. Eternal Father, in the name of Jesus, all of these brothers and sisters, Father, in the name of Jesus. Let your fire come into their hearts, burn in their bones by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, let that fire consume everything that does not please you, everything that does not honor you, everything that does not glorify you. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Heavenly Father. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. My Father, in the name of Jesus, set them apart. Set them apart. Set them apart for yourself, for your kingdom, and for your glory. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Receive an impartation of fire in the name of Jesus. Receive it in your heart, in your bones, in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the lukewarm generation, you will burn for the glory of God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen.